All right. Hi there. My name is Jessica Crow, and I am the founder of Apogee, which is a change management training and consulting firm. And this is Change Leader Insights, which is a video series that um, I have created to interview people who are experts in change management, are change leaders in their organization, or have some perspective, opinion, uh, expertise in the areas of change. And today I have Michelle Yanahan with Change Fit 360. Thank you so much for being here. It's nice to meet you. Oh, it's great to meet you, Jessica, and I'm thrilled to be here, part of the uh, list of people that you've had on your show and excited about our discussion today. Yeah, definitely. So Michelle and I, um, we've, we're have connected through many different industry forums, um, ACMP, Association of Change Management Professionals being one of them. Um, I've heard Michelle talk. Uh, we've been on forums together and she reached out and had this great idea to talk about human-centric change. So I um, wanted to give uh, her that platform, give give you all this conversation because I have no doubt we'll learn a lot from Michelle. But before we get into that, Michelle, do you want to give a little bit of background about yourself, um, more about who you are in Change Fit 360? Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Jessica. So just like you, I have primarily a training, but also a consulting coaching business, Change Fit 360. Uh, we do public training, corporate training, some coaching and consulting on the side. I say we do everything change. So we help organization teams and individuals embed change. We're a qualified education provider for ACMP, SHRM, and International Coaching Federation, which is new. Very and cool. uh, and I love to, thanks, and I love to work not only with corporate clients and public courses, I love to give back in ACMP and ATD and SHRM and PMI, all those industry associations that I think are so critical for human connection. So I love it. It's all I do is, you know, every variation of change from change agility to change change management, to change leadership, setting up communities of practice or centers of excellence, you name it. I've got my hands in it. Very nice. Well, and then, so the topic of human centric change, this is yes. really top of mind for you. Um, would yes. love to hear your perspective. How would you define human centric change? Yeah. So I think, first of all, stepping back a little bit, I think the time for this is right. Absolutely. If you look at what's happening in organizations and COVID maybe was the start of it, or maybe we were already there, you know, some of the social movements, COVID, quiet quitting, the great resignation, and then you put in the mix that companies are trying to be more strategic and continue to innovate. And just the amount of change, the volume of change that's on people, you know, we're just saturated and fatigued. Mm -hmm. And if you if you also think about kind of traditional change management, um, it can be somewhat systematic. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, you know, we definitely have created not we, but the industry has created change management as a discipline similar to project management, right. step one, step two, step three, step four. And while that's great from a learning curve perspective, that doesn't necessarily map with how people adapt or adapt to change. I agree. So when I, yeah. So when I say human centric change, really what I'm saying is more of a focus on what people feel. If you think Mm -hmm. about traditional change management and what we're really good at, what we've really ingrained is what people need to know, you know, think communications and training for change and what people need to do. If I show Mm -hmm. you in training, I have you do it. And you and I both know just because I tell you something and I show you doesn't mean you change. Yeah. If that was true, you know, you would tell me don't eat ice cream for dinner every night, Michelle, because it's bad for you. And I would then never probably eat ice cream for dinner again. And simply <laughs> that doesn't happen. No, right. So we've been focused on the need to know and need to do, need to do, which are important, but the element of kind of need to feel, um, which is really more, again, that human element I think is, is missing. Mm-hmm. And if I think about that, that's really about, you know, as a human being, is it okay for me to be human? Meaning, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, can I adapt at my own pace? It, can I make a mistake? Can I, can I have a failure in going through this and still feel psychologically safe and protected in my environment? You know, is this change? Do I have enough bandwidth to even take all this on? Is it even feasible? Yeah. So yeah. again, just some kind of common elements of, so I, so I would say human centric change is essentially allowing people, you know, the, to make things normal that are as part of being a human being. Right? Yeah. And it's very much a mindset shift and how we, you know, very I, much. I was on a, a webinar 
uh, in January where I brought up the topic of human centric change and someone asked, well, how is that different than what change managers have always been doing? We've always been focused on people. And a lot of the things that you just described, mm -hmm. I, you know, I reiterated that. And I think the way that I like to think about it is we're caring for the human side of change. I love and that. I agree with you too, that the time is right. That pre pandemic, there was less of an appetite or I don't, I don't know what it was, but the environment wasn't right for that level of empathy and compassion that exists yes. today yes. where there's more of an understanding that all change has to go through people to get implemented and people are feeling fatigued that Absolutely. their work life and their home life, they blend together and compartmentalizing is just not, you know, how people operate. And so there's Absolutely. just much more of a uh, appreciation for let's bring your whole, whole selves to work, obviously appropriately, but bring your whole selves yes. to work. And we value you for who you are. And we take into consideration those factors that you just described. So, yeah. um, I love that the way you explained it. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, and I, and I also think Jessica, if I could just jump mm -hmm. in, Please. I think there's a nice balance between Again, traditional change management, we still need the process. We still Absolutely. need, you know, the people to know and people to do, right? And we don't want to be so far the other way that, you know, no, that's okay that you didn't do it and we can wait yeah. two years for you to come along. So I think yeah. I think it is less a, it's about bringing um, some, some nuances into our toolkit mm -hmm. that care for that human self, but mm -hmm. also, right, we've got a job to do. After all, we're doing change to get organizational benefits ROI of our projects and we still need to achieve that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a balance unless, you know, it's, it's not one or the other, I guess is what yeah. I would say. I agree, um, yeah. It's bringing in some elements. Um, I have eight elements that I'm kind of focused on in, in order to bring it forward and, yeah. and bringing those into what we do today, right? Just being more mindful or intentional about yeah. the human and how, you know, how much change and how they individually are adapting and adapting to change. Yeah. I was going to ask what, yes. you know, recognizing that many practitioners have been trained in the tra traditional methodology, what would you recommend they do differently? What, um, you know, mindset tools, practices, could they yeah. integrate into their approach that would deliver more of that human centric experience? Yeah. So uh, a couple come to mind and these are some of the elements I discussed or described. Mm -hmm. One is um, I'm very much uh, a proponent of appreciative inquiry. And for your folks that may not know what that is, it's simply, right, how do we look and build and start from and continue through the process with what's positive and strengths of an organization, of teams, of individuals? Mm -hmm. And in organizations and as humans, we very much like to start from the deprecated place. We like to problem right. solve. Our minds want to solve problems. So we always go there. Uh, what didn't work? What can we fix? What can mm -hmm. we improve? And again, back to balance. It's important to be aware of all that, but there are positive strengths of organizations, teams, individuals, and the last change we did that we can pull forward. So I mm -hmm. think that by starting with positive and kind of pulling that forward, that helps tap into the good. So yeah. that's a simple, it sounds simple, maybe not as simple as it sounds, but that's something that I'm very much kind of top of mind. I've been talking about that topic for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, another thing that I think that lots of practitioners and organizations don't, aren't aware of, or if they're, they're aware of it, we don't really work with it the right way is how much change, right? Yeah. And really getting in the shoes of the people that are, we're trying to have adapt and adopt that change. And so I have a heat map. Um, and what I like to do with that heat map is say, number one, you know, here's all the change that the stakeholder group is experiencing right now. Is that okay, leader? Right. Mm -hmm. And if, and you know, you know, the drill here, Jessica, the leader is going to say, yep, Michelle, we've got to move forward with all that because all that has been budgeted, planned, paid for, et cetera. Mm -hmm. okay? So step one is, do we have to move forward with all this? And the answer, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time is yes. Right. So then the next question is, okay, for any of these efforts that are concurrently happening, and I'm not just talking about go live, I'm talking about the entire period it mm -hmm. takes for people to adopt, become proficient, and sustain that change. Mm -hmm. The second question is, can we chunk these in some way where they feel smaller, less heavy? And again, Jessica, you and I both know 99.9% .9 of the time, or maybe 90% or higher, leader says, nope, Michelle, Jessica, we can't do that. 
<laughs> so then what do we do? And this is where we as change professionals or practitioners, I think, can play. Mm -hmm. So if we have this heat map, we can actually look and say, what are some like for like projects, you know, that are hitting stakeholder groups, maybe same change impact. Mm -hmm. And do we have the opportunity to do one communication versus two, one training versus two, kind of simplify the weight of change yeah. without losing the value? And, and sometimes the answer is no. Right. But at least we're being intentional. We're using a visualization, some data from change impact to make some decisions. And we're trying to get out in front of, yes, there's a ton of change. Right. And we know people are fatigued and saturated. And so we're trying to lead it from more the way they are adapting and adopting it, which you and I both know is not one project at a time. It's everything that's on my desk. Right. So that's two things I would say. Um, another one, just kind of picking up my favorites here. Yeah. Another one is I think organizations, and, and a lot of this is big culture shift too, won't happen overnight. And some organizations won't be open to it, but something for change folks to think about. I think we need to normalize change resistance. Yes. Um, thank you. Yeah. I, <laughs> it's part I of mean, the process. It's normal. <laughs> yes. It's part of the process. And if we normalize it and say it's okay, and we actually look at it like what I think it really is, which is a differing viewpoint, a uh, differing viewpoint, uh, maybe the voice of reason, devil's advocate, call it whatever you want. Mm -hmm. It can become a very value add part of the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think organizations oftentimes are we're like, oh, we hear resistance. That's all bad. We got to squash that. Go get rid of that. You know, something's, something's not happening right. When in turn, it actually, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And if we can capture and bring that resistance, that voice into how we lead change, again, we're using more that caring approach for humans, yeah. understanding that we're all individuals. We all think differently about things and we've got to be inclusive in, in what we think. So yeah. three things, positive and strengths, big picture with some ideas about how to mitigate the weight and then resistance as normalized. Yeah. Oh, I love those. Those are really helpful. Yeah. Two questions for you. Um, one, and, and this sort of stems from what you were just uh, explaining. One, what are your thoughts on the value and opportunity for change management practitioners to move further upstream, recognizing they might be able to get some of those important conversations going before the decisions are made, right? And have yes. more air traffic control, uh, you know, opportunity. And then the second question is, um, what are your thoughts on the terminology or at least thinking about developing organizational resilience versus mm -hmm. focusing on resistance? This is something that I have talked about, but there still seems to be a little bit of a disconnect in terms of what that means. But because resistance is part of the process, it's healthy, it's normal, there's value in it. You know, how would you maybe phrase yeah. what that other side is? So first question being, you know, where, where can change managers go further upstream in the decision-making? Do you agree? And what does that look like? Yes. Um, I was lucky enough back when I was in corporate America, before I ever started my organization that I moved myself up to the, to the part of the project management process where we were conceptualizing projects. And so we had oh, yeah. early in, in terms of, you know, even without all the information early in to start to shape what it would look like and what we needed to think about. Yeah. Um, I think, I think change belongs at that table and you're right in many organizations, it's, you know, oh, you're training communication, so yeah. I can just give it to you later down. And, and so I think there's a misunderstanding in many organizations, and Jessica, you clearly get this, that changes, you know, just training and communications, and it's meant to make people feel happy, which yeah. I would argue yeah. is not the case yeah. at all. <laughs> um, so that the further upstream or closer to project initiation, inception, or even conceptualization we are at, I think the better. And yeah. with that being said, I think also having sort of you know, and it's, it's hard to say an enterprise viewpoint of change, but a larger lens than just one project initiative or effort is also helpful to kind of help size and, and think about that, you know, how that's going to shape together. So I'm a huge proponent of let's get in early. Let's get in as much as we can. You know, even if the project gets killed, at least there were, you know, some eyes on it, some forethought about the people side and what else is happening in the environment. Yeah. There's I think someone looking at it and yes. thinking about it with that lens that I'm sure the other leaders in the room are thinking about, but not with the same intention and purpose. So absolutely. Um, yeah. We need to be at the table. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, and what second, about the other side? Yeah, yeah. The second question is the resilience. Mm -hmm. So um, I think personally that especially given 
where we are with COVID and all these other things. But even before that, I would have said yeah. this, that resilience is a skill of today, not tomorrow, right? Yeah. That, you know, if I, if I go to an organization today, right, and they have 20 changes and I say, Jessica, I'm quitting here because there's just too much change. And I go to another organization, guess what? Different Same. change, different. <laughs> yeah, you can't escape it, right? Yeah. So you either have to, what's the old saying? You got to, you know, if you quit or you join, right? Right. So yeah. I think, I think resilience for me really is how can we find and make people aware and more visible about proof points of success? Yeah. And people might say, you know, especially people who are highly resistant to change might say, ah, I hate all change. It's always hard for me. But I always go back to kind of a fun dialoguing tool that I have. I'll, I'll just share it with you real quick for your yeah. listeners they can put it into their toolkit. Wonderful. Um, if you think back, and, and this works with everybody unless you've been at one job your entire life, okay? So if you've had more than one job, this works. You have somebody think back to, um, you know, a, a day one of a new job, whatever job it is. And you ask them, okay, day one of your new job, you know, how comfortable did you feel? How quickly could you do whatever your kind of routine tasks and responsibilities are, maybe day one to day four weeks or so? Mm -hmm. How quickly? And what kind of errors did you make? What kind of error ratio? So it's day one. You know, we all come in day one. We're probably not super comfortable. We're probably making errors. And it's going to take us longer to do whatever because we're learning the culture and the systems and the people, et cetera, et cetera. So now if you fast forward, I say six months, but could be three months. I don't know. And you ask somebody about that same job, uh, where they are in their level of comfort, speed, and error ratio, 99.9%. .9 I had one person who went against me, so even more than that. <laughs> I use it all the time in training. Um, we'll say, yeah, I'm more comfortable. I've got more speed and I've got less errors. And then, so that's a success proof point. But even more yeah. importantly than that, my next question is, well, how did you get there? What, what was most responsible for you growing comfort, speed, proficiency, error ratio, or errors going down? And then they tell you, you know, da, 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 da. so another thing I like to do with that is say, number one, you've just shown me you can get through change. And number mm -hmm. two, you've told me what was most responsible for you getting there. If I can point to in the change we're doing now, mm -hmm. those elements or build those elements into my change, guess what? your success elements are there. Yeah. So yeah. All of a sudden their resistance, their fear, their resiliency, you know, changes based on that dynamic yeah. or that dialogue. Yeah. Um, so that's one of my favorite kind of one-to-one -one or group dialogue to say, everybody's had success with change. It could yeah. not, you know, it's not exactly the same person to person in what got them there, or what success looks like, but we all have a proof point we can lean back on. And once yeah. you've been successful, it's easier to say, yeah, I can be successful on the next one. Yeah. That's such a great example. And then I'm imagining how that has contributed to one of your eight elements that's in your human centric change recommendation. Absolutely. Yeah. Showing success right. measure, you know, through the journey, right. Yeah. Incrementally through the journey. Absolutely. My hair sticking straight up. <laughs> I know, I'm like, and, yeah. Me too. Me too. Um, I love though. I do love um, how the conversation, the words we use, you know, in the change management space are starting to shift and yes. we might be saying the same things, but slightly different, but really the key takeaway that I'm getting here, um, is that, you know, the way that we interact and work with people, it's all about building that connection, helping them recall 100%. those moments of, I can do this, like building that yes. confidence as you guide them through that discomfort, that goes along with growth and learning and change. So absolutely. Um, and, I, and I'm we're buying into that understanding yeah. too. And I, I love what you just said. And um, I fell on one of my own cardinal rules when we were talking about resistance. So I've, yeah. I've sort of changed the terminology for resistance as well. Yeah. Because I think when I think of resistance, um, and since it's a video, this will make sense. I think of this, you know, I resist <laughs> and this, this essentially means go away. Right? Yeah. But if I tell you I have an objection, I have an objection. It yeah. feels more like I have an objection, but I'm open to listening That's and working with you. About it. Yeah. So I, I do agree with you that words matter. Semantics as it, as it may be does matter. Yeah. It does matter. Um, so I am changing my terminology on a lot of things. I um, really do like that though. I mean, that yeah. makes it more, you know, as you were saying that I was thinking about how in, you know, some of the clients that I'm currently working with, for example, 
the concept of resistance when you've made a multi million dollar investment and there's a deadline, there's a, they care at the same time. It's like it's going to happen regardless, mm-hmm. right? And so when you think about resistance, it does come up with that negative connotation that I'm putting my feet in the ground when really it's people wanting to feel heard, uh, have their, you know, Absolutely. probably the impacted stakeholders likely didn't have a choice in whether or not that change was happening. And so that I object is such a, um, is more inclusive. And I think leaders up and down the chain will understand, okay, I, I want to listen. I want to understand versus, you know, I'm putting my feet in the ground because it's yes. going to happen anyway. So get with, what was it? Uh, get with the job or, or, or leave or something like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whatever the saying was. So that's just such a great way of yeah. framing it. For well, I, I, re- I really like something else that you just said, because it also speaks to me very much. And that is you mentioned leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that as an industry for change, you know, we've we've kind of overlooked in some ways the role of the people leader and how mm-hmm. instrumental they are in, you know, not not only awareness and activating change, but really reinforcing that change. Right. Mm-hmm. And you know, a lot of my practice is about the behavior model. And if you think about Pavlov's dog, that old, that old experiment, Mm -hmm. you know, the number one element of that, even though all three elements were important was the dog treats, you know, the reinforcement. Yes. Yeah. And leaders really, you know, they have more day-to-day contact than your average change professional ever will with their Mm -hmm. team members. You know, they indirectly uh, control that person's paycheck. They set priority Mm -hmm. and direction. And a good leader should know what motivates people, which is different, you know, different from you to me, right? Right. Where we as change professionals sort of on the outside looking in, you know, we don't have that, uh, that relationship with all those team members. So I think there's a role for leaders to play and it plays not only in traditional change management, but also here, you know, in human centric change, Um, because again, they better understand, you know, what motivates me, what makes you tick. Yeah. Um, than I ever will. And and it, so sort of industry-wide, if we think about change, I think there needs to be more movement on leaders' role in change. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not building a change plan, you know, or uh, creating one communication. It's really, you know, how do you activate your team for human behavior, right? Which is really yeah. with change, we're really trying to get behavior repeated, repeated, repeated. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I love that you brought up leaders because that's another topic that I am uh, very passionate about uh, training and coaching leaders on how to be, you know, more rounded when it comes to driving their teams through change. Yeah. And that really does speak to that human centric um, component. Yes. How would you, you know, I have run across this myself and with people that I work with as a change lead on a project or a change working with people leaders, you don't necessarily have the budget to give to the people leaders or the means to, you know, throw a party or whatever the, you know, the yeah, need, whatever yeah. the people manager wants to do, the people leader wants to do. How would you coach someone who is a change management practitioner on what they can do practically um, to, to support that people leader reinforcement piece without having budget authority, you know, those type of things. Yeah. So, um, when I work on change, I like to make it easy for people. Mm -hmm. So for both leaders, SMEs, change champions, I create toolkits Mm -hmm. that they can, you know, simply pull together. And my toolkits always have, okay, share this, but here's some discussion questions for feedback, right? Dialogue. I'm trying to make it easy because you and I both know that, you know, if I, if you're a leader and you come to me and I say, well, I need you to do X, Y, Z, but I don't really tell you or give you a frame for how to do it, you're going to say, Michelle, I've got a million other things to do. And and so if I do it, it's going to be, you know, I wrote an email, done, check, right? And we both right. know that's not effective. Right. So I try to enable those influencers, leaders, stakeholders as best I can mm-hmm. with toolkits, which could be a combination of talking points, but always ways to dialogue with their team and bring feedback back. Um, most of the changes that I've worked on, kind of in my consulting, have had no budget, zero. Right. Um, so I've gotten scrappy and creative about creating videos and different things, you know, that I could do myself to, you know, to make it work. Um, and again, providing leaders and champions, stakeholders with toolkits, things that they can take forward and they don't really have to, I hate to say they don't really have to think about it, but yeah. I'm just trying to make it kind of a one-stop shop for them. Yeah. Easy. 
easy. Yeah, and that could include like recommendations on what to do to absolutely reward yeah. or reinforce, which absolutely recognition goes a long way too. I think people, you know, absolutely um, appreciate that. <laughs> absolutely, that's a great way of reinforcing a change. Um, yes, maybe. yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. And getting creative, you know, I've done some games, I've done a whole bunch of other stuff and again, brought leaders into that or here, use this, you know, and it's yeah. created free, ready to go. Um, and I also try to, you know, again, not overwhelm them. So, you know, here's one thing for this, this two weeks or this three weeks. Now here's one thing, right. We can't expect them in addition to their full-time job to do, you know, here's 25 things I need you to do. Like that's right. not going to happen. Yeah. Right? Got to make it easy. Got to make it manageable. This is super helpful advice. And I agree that um, less is more, simple is better. And you've given some really incredible tips and uh, ideas on how to, how to, you know, lead change from a human centric perspective. What else would you, I mean, anything else that you would love to impart, have people in our profession, have business leaders, have people who are thinking about getting into change management, um, you know, drop it into their space and say, Hey, think about this as you're moving forward over 2023, how we can all collectively embrace this human centric aspect of leading and influencing change. Yeah. So, um, one other thing that, I love, and it doesn't work in all scenarios is, and let me explain first before I tell you what it, well, I'll tell you what it is and then I'll tell you why it doesn't always work. If we can give people the power of individual choice Mm -hmm. um, in, and, and how I would frame that is, you know, me as a change leader, you know, I say, oh, the change needs to go like this, whatever that is. Right. And then they get working in the field and you've, you've been there with this as well. And it's like, it doesn't really work that well. You know, I'm not in their shoes. I don't really you know, it doesn't exactly match up to what they need. So can we, you know, in situations where there's things don't have to be done exactly a certain way. So if you think about compliance or legal or financial or regulations, things have to be done. Step one, step two, step three, step four. Mm -hmm. We can't vary, no variation, but for other things, you know, if there's not a, a need like that, and we don't have any negative up or downstream impacts from some variation where possible, what's wrong with power of individual choice? And I don't mean that we're going to do, you know, we're going to do things, you know, 72 different ways, right? But more the idea of if the end goal is met, right, if the change, mm-hmm. if whatever we're doing, the change is meeting the ROI and, you know, we, and we're, we can allow people a little, bit, a little bit of autonomy and flexibility in how they do it and improve and optimize it. We not only get buy-in, we're going to get a lot more benefits and less pushback. And yeah. again, I realize that might be a bit controversial because there's a lot of things that have to be done, you know, step one, step two, step three, step four. And certainly I'm not saying again, that we want everybody to do their own thing in 72 different ways. Right. But I think there's something to that when I'm allowed to have some autonomy, flexibility and power of choice yeah. that makes it feel a little less rigid. And I'm a little bit more uh, happy and available to buy into it and move forward with it. I love that so much. I, I, I think about it as you know, empowering people to power change. Yes. And that's yes. what you were describing to me. And I'm just using different words because you said it much. Yeah. More yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, um, no, no. But I, I really liked how you described that. And you're really hitting too on what people uh, need to feel like they can't, the choices, you know, part of it, the control piece, I think bringing back a little oh, bit of control huge. because change happens, you sort of lose that. And that makes people uncomfortable. And so what you're doing is giving that back in yes. a way yes. where you've got the foundation and then, you know, you'd be an, 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 an adult and you do your thing. So yeah. <laughs> I like and, that a and lot. And kind of final, final thought, and it does, yeah. it does match with human centric change, you know, change is a, um, it's a team sport is what I say, or it's, it takes a community, right? So if you think about a community and sort of the, the governance, the rules, how communities form, you know, that has to be there and we've got to invite everybody in, right? We've got to, you know, take them where they're at, invite them in, bring them forward, use all their ideas. You know, that's all sort of part of, you know, building that community, if you will. And I think when we do that, 
you know, we're going to have more buy-in, we're going to have better uptick on change, adoption, proficiency, and sustainment, and that should result in getting our ROI goals and outcomes of our changes or our projects and initiatives faster. And again, I'm not saying organizations are there. We, I think we've got a lot of work to do. But um, hopefully in this time that we've talked, a couple ideas for folks to put into their toolkit mm -hmm. or things just to sort of uh, marinate on. Like, how yeah. would I bring that forward? How could I think about that? Would that work in my organization or with this project? Right? Yeah. I think any steps we make in this direction, Jessica, are a plus. I really I, do. I agree with you. Thank you for being a thought leader in this and driving so the conversation and creating space for it. Awareness is half the battle. Uh, and just being open to thinking about how we do what we do in a different way is, is really valuable. So thank you for taking time today to share your wisdom with me and with Apogee's community. Um, really appreciate it. And where can people find you if they're yeah. interested in taking your training or learning more yeah. about what you do? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, Jessica, for making the time for me. I, I loved the conversation. Uh, oh, very near and dear and close to my heart. Loving the conversation. Uh, Michelle at changefit360.com or changefit360.com is where you can find me. Um, I also on my website have, um, I actually have a blog right now about human centric change. Wonderful. In okay. addition to a bunch of other topics. So go and check it out, people. And uh, let me know or Jessica know what you think. And uh yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jessica. And, You're and, so uh, welcome. And are you on LinkedIn too? In case absolutely, can reach out Jessica, to okay. I am. They can reach yeah. out to me that way. I've, I've loved our time together. Me too. And, Thank uh, you so much. Let, let's work on some more human centric change, everybody for 2023. Yes. I'm with that. I'm with Yay. that. Well, thanks again. <laughs> and yeah, have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks, Jessica.